Well, any day we get to talk about Nathaniel Hawthorne is a pretty good day in my book. You can see Nathaniel Hawthorne's dates here. He was born in 1804, a year after Emerson is born, and he dies in uh, during the middle of the Civil War uh, in 1864. I know that many of you were forced uh, to read The Scarlet Letter when you were in high school, and all I can do is apologize for that and tell you how very sorry I am that you were forced to read such an incredible book at an age when you were just woefully unprepared for it. And many readers are surprised to learn that for Hawthorne, really the novel form was really not his strong suit. Really, Hawthorne's genius is really most readily identifiable in his short stories. When I was in graduate school, I took an entire seminar on Nathaniel Hawthorne, where for the entire semester, we read nothing but Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, and I can tell you that I have read everything that Nathaniel Hawthorne ever wrote, with the exception of his journals. Uh, I, I have read some of his journals, but I've read uh, all of his novels and all of his short stories. And uh, I, I came out of that experience uh, really, really understanding um, his importance in the canon of American literature. Uh, he truly was um, a gifted writer, really, in many ways, um, on the same par as Shakespeare um, uh, with respect to his understanding of American psychology, and not just American psychology, human psychology. I want to encourage you and remind each of you to please read the short biographical sections and sketches that come before the selections uh, for the writers that we're reading this semester. I will pull some information from these biographic sketches uh, to place in quizzes and exams and so forth. And then what I like to do, as you know, is to provide some supplemental uh, information to augment and complement what you've already read, uh, perhaps information that uh, the editors of your textbook did not include, but I think um, are insightful and can help illuminate our understanding of the writer. And Hawthorne is no exception. You've got a nice little sketch in your textbook uh, on Hawthorne's early years, but I want to give you some other um, background information. Uh, Hawthorne is born in Salem, Massachusetts. His father dies when uh, Hawthorne is a boy. Uh, he's an only child. He is uh, raised primarily by women, uh, mothers, aunts, and the like. Um, he is a descendant of Puritan ancestors, of uh, those early New England settlers, uh, people like Bradford and so forth, and John Winthrop, those early writers that we read. Uh, early on in the semester, you know, back when we got to see one another. Um, lots of times people mistakenly think uh, that Hawthorne was a Puritan, uh, and nothing could be further from the truth. By no way stretch of the imagination or stretch from the imagination can Hawthorne be thought of as a Puritan writer. He was fascinated by who they were as a culture and as a people about their, about their psychology, about the th the beliefs and superstitions uh, that made them tick, but Hawthorne was no a Puritan. In fact, uh, he, as I say here, he was uh, actually a descendant of one of the judges uh, of the Salem uh, witchcraft trials uh, in 1692. Hawthorne was educated at Bowdoin College in Maine. While he was there, he formed two friendships that he would have uh, throughout his life, two uh, longtime friends. The first, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, of course, goes on to become the most celebrated poet of the 19th century, the fireside poet that we studied a couple weeks ago, uh, and also a guy by the name of Franklin Pierce, uh, who would become the 14th president of the United States. And 
uh, uh, during Franklin Pierce's uh, campaign for the presidency, he uh, reached out to his old college chum, Nathaniel, and said, hey, Nathaniel, what I'd like for you to do is write a campaign biography of me. Uh, and that was very common, and it still is very common. You will often see uh, when an individual is considering a serious run uh, for the highest elected office, you will, in the years leading up to that run, you will see them begin putting out biographies or autobiographies. They all do this. Uh, and the idea is to cast uh, the individual in the most favorable light. Um, and this is precisely what Nathaniel Hawthorne did uh, for his friend Franklin Pierce. And when Franklin Pierce was uh, elected, he repaid Nathaniel Hawthorne by giving him a series of very cushy diplomatic positions or political jobs that really didn't require much uh, responsibilities or duties, but provided him a stipend provided him a salary, a revenue stream that would then allow Hawthorne to do what he was put on earth to do, which was to write. Uh, and that's what he did. He, he held a consulship, for example, in Liverpool. Yes, you know, the same Liverpool that gave us the Beatles. She loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, years before the Beatles, Hawthorne lived in Liverpool, uh, and he, um, uh, lived there with his family for several years, and that allowed him to uh, tour through Europe. And he later bases his last novel, the last novel that he completes, The Marvel Fawn, uh, uh, while he is living in England. Sorry, I went down that rabbit hole. But uh, at any rate, after college, he comes back to Salem, and he's... Um, he wants to write. Uh, he sees himself very much as a writer. He writes a novel uh, in while he's in college, but it's so bad, and he self-publishes it, but it's so bad that when he becomes Nathaniel Hawthorne, celebrated international writer, he does uh, seek out those early, uh, or that early novel, and destroys as many copies of it he can find, because it's a very sophomoric very juvenile and sort of uh, not fully, uh, not fully developed uh, uh, effort, and he was embarrassed by it. Hawthorne was in Salem preparing for a life of a writer. He read extensively, and uh, especially read quite closely and quite comprehensively, all of the New England histories that had been written to date, this gave him the fodder. It gave him the raw material that he could then craft into stories like Young Goodman Brown, stories like The Scarlet Letter, stories like um, The Minister's Black Veil, etc., etc., and Hawthorne's early endeavors, as I mentioned earlier, were mostly short stories because he could publish these in serial form in magazines of the day and uh, and get paid, uh, even though he published many of these tales in magazines and uh, literary annuals. They almost always appeared anonymously, and they did not do that much to advance really his literary career. It was only when he published those stories in a collected volume, two of them of note. First, Twice Told Tales, published in 1837, and then Mosses from an Old Man's in 1846. With these two collections of stories, Hawthorne became a recognized literary force. The second one of these, Mosses from an Old Man's, was a collection of stories uh, that uh, were written during the period that Hawthorne was living in Concord, Massachusetts. He was actually living, I mentioned this to you before when we were studying Emerson, uh, uh, Hawthorne and his wife Sophia lived in the Old Manse, which was that ancestral home of the Emerson family there in Concord, Massachusetts.
He and Sophia rented the old manse from Emerson. I think they paid $350 a year uh, to live there and, uh, and gave Emerson all the apples that he could eat. If you go there today and go upstairs, I think it's upstairs. It may be on the lower uh, first floor, first floor or second floor. Uh, you can see engraved in one of the windows uh, is an inscription that Sophia uh, inscribed using the diamond in her wedding ring uh, that talks about her being there, Sophia Hawthorne, uh, uh, and gives the date and look how they looked out at, a, I think, a snowy scene or something like that. You can find pictures of it on the interweb. Oh, here we go. I was getting ahead of myself. Imagine that. In 1842, he marries Sophia um, of Salem, Sophia Peabody, very prominent uh, family in Salem, and Hawthorne's primary focus turned to his family. His masterpiece, The Scarlet Letter, appeared in 1850 and became an international sensation uh, with critics in Great Britain and the United States proclaiming him to be the finest American romance writer. Other novels would follow, including The House of the Seven Gables, 1851, Blythdale Romance, 1852. Remember, Blythdale Romance is Hawthorne's sort of satirical uh, parody of the transcendentalist's uh, efforts at Brook Farm, their efforts and their um, attempt to live in a utopian community. Well, if that idea fascinates you, uh, the Blythdale romance is Hawthorne's uh, rather cynical uh, parody of the uh, of this group of writers who he, he thought were a little wacky. And then his last novel was The Marble Fawn in 1860, unlike anything that Hawthorne had ever written because it is set in Italy. And we think of Hawthorne, we always think, we tend to think of his sense of place. In other words, the, the settings of his stories and novels are so uniquely and so uh, uh, so closely connected to the American landscape. Uh, and the American psyche. As a literary artist, Hawthorne displayed a love for allegory and symbol. In Hawthorne's art, we see him repeatedly dealing with tensions involving light versus dark, good versus evil, warmth versus cold, these sorts of um, uh, polar opposites, faith versus doubt, the heart versus the mind, the internal world versus the external world. His writing is representative of 19th century writing and thus in the mainstream due to his use of nature, its primitiveness, and as a use of inspiration. Also, in his use of the exotic, the gothic, and the antiquarian. If we're going to discuss Hawthorne's influences, certainly his early childhood growing up in Salem, uh, later working at the Custom House uh, in Salem, which is where the story of the Scarlet Letter begins. The first section is called the Custom House. Well, the Custom House that he's writing about and, uh, and, and the seed of that story, it's actually a frame, a narrative frame, is that uh, Custom House in Salem, Massachusetts, where Hawthorne was, uh, was working as a political appointee. Uh, a second major influence is that Puritan ancestry, that background of his. One of his forefathers, Judge Hathorne, that's not a typographical error there. That is the way that Hawthorne's surname was written in the 17th century. You can see there was no W there. Um, the 
myth, I'm not really sure how true it is, is that uh, one of the witches put a curse on uh, Judge Hathorne, um, uh, and then a later descendant decided, well, in an attempt to um, evade or elude that curse, uh, we're going to change the spelling of our name. And so we'll throw a W in there, uh, you know, as if that would work. Again, I don't uh, don't quote me on that. I'm not sure how entirely accurate that myth is, but it's certainly one that uh, is circulating. Obviously, the belief in the existence of the devil or the existence of evil. And then finally, a belief in determinism, an idea, the, the idea of determinism, if we haven't really talked about that before, is the notion that individuals don't really have that much control or free will over their existence, over their lives, over their fates. And so that idea of determinism suggests that our lives um, uh, are already determined for us by a set of unique circumstances, be them heredity, uh, genetics, uh, the environment, uh, and so forth. And, and Hawthorne would uh, fall into uh, that school of thought. I've mentioned to you that Hawthorne and Emerson knew one another. Uh, uh, they did. And, uh, and while they lived uh, in Concord together uh, in different homes, uh, but again, Hawthorne living, renting from Emerson, that first Emerson home, the old manse, um, I could not think of two uh, different sorts of men. Uh, in passing from Emerson and Thoreau to Hawthorne, we have moved I should say we do move to a life with very different orientations, to an artistic career that was faced with far more difficult problems. Um, Emerson is what we would call that light romantic. Emerson is an optimist. He believes in the potentiality of all things, of the goodness of human beings and the evils of institutions. Hawthorne, not so much. Hawthorne didn't believe in the innate goodness of human beings. Hawthorne and Melville and later Poe, uh, I should say similarly Poe, uh, are what we consider dark romantics. They're far more interested in the ambiguity of the human condition, of the human beings, of humans' ability for cruelty, for evil, uh, for the darkness, for, for the macabre, for the gothic, uh, for the spooky things uh, that sometimes... Um, mark our experience as human beings. Consider this quote by Emerson uh, on Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne's reputation as a writer is a very pleasing fact because his writing is not good for anything. And this is a tribute to the man. Wow. Right. Uh, and this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson's son, my father, in other words, Emerson, my father could not read Hawthorne because of the gloom of his magic mirror. I love that quote because it really does uh, illuminate and sort of crystallize the fundamental difference between Emerson and Hawthorne. The mirror that Hawthorne looked in was a gloomy mirror. And Emerson could not abide that sense of pessimism, that negativity, that darkness. Hawthorne studied from a distance the delusions of Emerson's, how he referred to the transcendentalists, warped disciples. He confessed that though he admired Emerson as a poet of deep beauty and austere tenderness, he, quote, sought nothing from him as a philosopher. So no real love lost between Emerson and Hawthorne artistically. The two men knew one another and were friendly enough with one another and polite to one another. And from what I've read of Emerson's biography, and I've read quite a few of them, Emerson wanted <clears throat> or reached out to Hawthorne 
uh, and I think wanted a, a closer friendship, a closer um, uh, to, to be considered a more intimate friend uh, for Hawthorne. But Hawthorne wasn't having it. Uh, Hawthorne was not interested in forming an intimate, close friendship with Emerson. If we were in class, I would show you some quotes uh, from Hawthorne about, uh, uh, well, in the first instance, uh, Fanny Fern, uh, whom he referred to and lumped in with uh, the damned mob of scribbling women. Now, feminists usually get up in arms when they read this quote of Hawthorne's. Um, Hawthorne. Uh, even though he was celebrated and uh, internationally renowned, he was not making a lot of money on his books and on his stories. And there were far more uh, women writers who were uh, making more money at the craft than he was. And I think that bothered him because I think Hawthorne saw himself as truly a more literary more artistic writer. In other words, he thought the stuff that he was writing was more important, more substantial, uh, more eternal uh, than, say, the scribbling of a Fanny Fern, although he liked Fanny Fern. Um, but Hawthorne didn't make a lot of money uh, on uh, on the books. Uh, I think on the in the in the decade between uh, between. 18 uh, Scarlet Letters published in 1850 in that decade between 1850 and 1860. I think that Hawthorne only earned fifteen hundred dollars on uh, the Scarlet Letter. Um, there, he, here's the thing. Uh, this was before the international copyright uh, was a law. And so what was happening when books would become popular in America or in London, for that matter, uh, they would be then taken abroad and and a publishing house would set up a print of the textbook and they uh, of any of the book the novel and so forth and they would print and uh, and print numerous copies of these things and sell them and the artist the writer would not get any revenue uh, for his or her work and so this was very very popular uh, practice of the day and it of course was uh, not fair uh, to the Producers of the right, uh, producers of the art. The second uh, link I was going to link to here is was a, is a passage. It's in your textbook. Uh, uh, it's in Melville's section, Hawthorne and his mosses. Um, Hawthorne and Melville were cut from the same artistic cloth. They share that same dark uh, vision or view of the American uh, psyche and of the human condition. And in Hawthorne and his mosses, it's Melville's uh, essay critiquing some of Hawthorne's earliest stories. And he celebrates and acknowledges and recognizes that Hawthorne is perhaps America's Shakespeare. Central themes to Hawthorne. Now, this doesn't mean that all of these themes are present in everything that he wrote, but these are recurring themes to be on the lookout for as you read Young Goodman Brown and The Minister's Black Veil. Uh, first, alienation. What does that mean? Alienation occurs when a character becomes in a state of isolation. That isolation can be due to his or her own doing. Or it can be society imposing isolation on the individual or a combination of both. We'll see that in both stories, in Young Goodman Brown and in Minister's Black Veil. Initiation. Uh, initiation involves the attempts of the alienated character to get rid of his isolated condition and somehow find community, to find a a connection and a bond with another human being, thus no longer being isolated, but rather being initiated into a community of like-minded people. We will definitely see that 
in young Goodman Brown. The problem of guilt is a common theme in so much of Hawthorne's um, work. Uh, a character's sense of guilt forced by a puritanical heritage or by society. Also, uh, the theme of guilt versus innocence. Uh, pride, excessive pride especially. The fancy word for that is hubris, H-U-B-R-I-S. Hawthorne treats pride in his fiction as being a manifestation of evil. He illustrates the following aspects of pride in so many characters. We see it in my kinsman Major Molyneux's character, Robin. We see it in young Goodman Brown and in Ethan Brown, both characters who possess excessive spiritual pride. We see intellectual pride in stories like The Birthmark, which is a great story. In fact, if you find that you like these stories, do me a favor or do yourself a favor and read The Birthmark. You will love it. It's still a very timely, timely story. And then Rappuccini's Daughter. Uh, the New England Puritan background. I mentioned that a few slides ago. He had such a command of New England's lore. Uh, the puritanical uh, culture, its myths, uh, its uh, atrocities, its uh, superstitions, its histories, its characters. And he drew upon this repeatedly. It informs. It's so baked into so much of his fiction. Uh, the Italian background, I mentioned that. This is a minor theme because it only really shows up in one novel, The Marble Fawn. Um, the concept, uh, uh, I mentioned to you that uh, Hawthorne was quite fond of allegory, which is uh, a literary uh, genre, a literary form. It can be allegorical, uh, where we see characters who um, I think, uh, well, the best example I can think of off the top of my head is young Goodman Brown uh, and his wife, whose name is Faith. So, uh, her name functions and the character functions allegorically because we are invited to view faith not only as a breathing, living uh, character of flesh and bone as uh, in his, uh, his physical wife, but we also see and are invited uh, through the art of Hawthorne to see faith as an allegory, right, as an abstraction, as a concept as young Goodman Brown's faith, right? So that's what we mean by allegory, where characters have names that represent larger abstractions or ideals. Uh, <clears throat> other themes can include the individual versus society. I don't want to read all of these out to you, but you can see them listed for you here. A lot of themes uh, we see evident in um, the collected stories and novels of Hawthorne. And, you know, just looking at each of these listed out here, uh, you can see how it is that uh, Hawthorne uh, is a dark romantic, can't you? Or how he's fundamentally different from, a, from an Emerson or from a Thoreau. So it's impossible, really, to read much of Hawthorne's work without realizing that what really interested him, perhaps more than anything else about human beings, is our capacity for evil, our capacity to act out that part and the part of Satan. His novels and stories are filled with characters such as Ethan Brand of the story of the same name of Goodman Brown and young Goodman Brown of Hooper and the Minister's Black Veil, etc., all who are portraits of human darkness. Hawthorne died in 1864 in Plymouth, New Hampshire. 
he was uh, was actually with his old friend, Frank Ben Pierce, uh, the ex-president by then. Uh, he died while walking uh, with his friend through the countryside. He's buried in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord, Massachusetts. If we were in class together, these are some of the questions we might entertain. And I will ask you um, to respond to one or two of these uh, in an upcoming quiz or maybe even on an exam. Who knows? Hope you guys are doing well. It goes without saying how much I miss you uh, and uh, how badly I wish that all of this nonsense would stop and that we could be together again as a class. Uh, please uh, let me know how things are going uh, and how you're doing. If you have any questions or any comments, uh, um, anything at all.